Hello, everyone, and welcome to Harbor Time Strategy Talks. I'm your host, Colin Harbor, and all I can say is what a week it's been since uh, since we last recorded the podcast. Um, in keeping with my um, not talking about politics, um, I'm not going to, but suffice it to say, I'm ready to move past uh, some of the issues. Um, I was actually thinking a little bit about my children. I mean, you know, in the last year, my children have seen a pandemic kick off. They've seen presidents impeach or a president impeach. Now, maybe again, we've seen riots in 2020, riots in 2021. And, you know, you got to think about what that might feel like as a child. Um, this is a business strategy podcast, so I'll focus on other things. But, you know, there's a lot to think about here about what's going on, particularly for those of us who have children. Um, as always, regarding the, the podcast, I appreciate your feedback. I appreciate your comments. Uh, please subscribe to the podcast. Like it if you're watching it on YouTube. Subscribe on YouTube. Um, and, you know, quite frankly, I appreciate the feedback. I appreciate it when you shoot me a text and say, hey, when you talked about this, that meant something. It, it lets me know that you're actually listening and not just saying you are. Uh, but I, I appreciate the feedback too. Um, please feel free to share it with others. It's always great to get um, a broader uh, group of people listening to it. Um, so I've got a couple of questions to, 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 to think about. Have you ever wondered what it feels like or what it's like to train and compete as a triathlete? We'll get to that in a few minutes. Um, have you ever considered purchasing a company that has been family run for 20, 25, 30 years, maybe a little bit less, and considered how are you going to maintain the culture? How are you going to handle the transition with a company that's been family run or family owned, maybe by a, a, you know, an, an individual, a strong personality for years? Maybe have you ever thought about how these two things might be related or, or might be correlated? Um, I don't know. We'll, we'll, try to uh, we'll try to match them up a little bit uh, today, um, but I'm going to go ahead and introduce our next guest. Um, Trent Simmons is a guy that I met a couple of years ago and have really gotten to know over the last couple of years. Um, we've met about a couple of things. We've had coffee and, and I'm not lying. I didn't tell Trent I was going to say this, but when I started the podcast last summer and started thinking about, well, now I've got to get guests. Now I've got to get people on the show. Trent Simmons was one of the guys that I wanted to have on the podcast. Um, finally got the courage to ask him a couple of weeks ago and, and he said yes. So, um, you know, we've stayed in contact, like I've said, had coffee with him a few times. He's, he's, he's great to talk to. He's got a great mind, a great business mind. Um, Trent is the CEO of Hardeman Company. And uh, he has a passion for small businesses. So I'm going to read a couple of things from LinkedIn and, and some other taglines. But Trent and his brother took a natural gas marketing company from their father. And, and essentially, that was the genesis of Hardeman. Um, according to LinkedIn, Hardeman seeks to purchase businesses that they can own and operate as owners for the long haul. They're not looking for a quick flip, I think, is the way I read that. Um, they want businesses that are built the way they are built. So we'll get to that in a minute. Um, they look for businesses that have run for the previous 25 years and, and hope to continue to run them for the next 25 years. So small businesses built through character, work ethic and relationships, manufacturing, distribution and service related companies business owners who want to see their legacy preserved and their employees and customers are taken care of. And so that's why I asked that question earlier about buying companies and preserving the culture and, and maintaining the culture with, while also growing the business, you know, trying to grow the business. So like I mentioned, I've really gotten to know Trent over the last couple of years. So let me go ahead and kick it over to Trent for a minute. Hey, Trent, how's it going? Hey, Colin, I'm doing great. And I really appreciate the introduction and and it's a privilege to be on the podcast. So I, I, I do thank you for, uh, for the invite. All right. Well, great. So can you tell us a little bit about yourself? Who is Trent Simmons and what are you up to these days? Yeah, that's, that's a good question. And I guess a, a pretty deep question. I'll see if I can sum it up in a few statements. But, uh, you know, I'm, I'm 
just a small business owner. I'm somebody that's very passionate about small business. I've, I've grown up, uh, grown up in it. I've worked in it. It's just in my bones. Uh, I've seen, I've seen my, my grandparents uh, start small businesses. My dad has started small businesses. So uh, I am, I really see myself as a, a preservationist, at least in regards to small businesses and, and the amazing opportunities that small businesses provide. Uh, not only to to the economy, but to this country in total. And, and a lot of people like to use the phrase small business is the backbone to this economy. And we like to say that we put our money where our mouth is and, and actually support small business. Okay. Well, great. So um, I know we'll get into some more about your experiences and some other things in a minute, but let's talk about Hardeman Company now, because I, I mentioned Hardeman Company. I meant, uh, mentioned the LinkedIn page and one of the things that it mentioned is you're looking, you know, for companies that, that are similar to how you were built. So I want to ask you, how are you built? I mean, from a business standpoint, how is Trent, how are, is Hardeman Company built? Yeah, so Hardeman comes from the first, uh, the first of our families that got here to Texas. His name was Thomas Hardeman Simmons. And Hardeman uh, just stands for someone who is strong-willed, uh, perseveres. Uh, and we just think that's exactly the embodiment of a small business company and, and, and a great way to embody the legacy of where we come from. Um, we, we seek to find those small businesses. We, we think small businesses are, are, are integral to this, com to this country. We think that you know, people really put their blood, sweat, and tears into these businesses, not only the business owner, but the employees that were willing to take the chance with the business owner. Uh, to make these companies great and and we think that should be rewarded and and protected and so what we are at hardeman is a holding company i guess you could say in the very technical term we're a holding company for other small businesses we provide a graceful way for business owners to exit the business um, and we find a way to take over uh, the company and the people that are that are integral to that business um, trying to maintain jobs and to hopefully maybe grow some of those companies uh, into the future. Okay, well, great. So that's so I want to talk about some of the the experiences you've had or the business owners that you've met. May, you know, not individually, not talk about anybody individually, but if you had to pick two or maybe even three key traits of the CEO leaders of these businesses. What stands out and what drives these, these business leaders, the entrepreneurs, if you will, who have built successful businesses that are acquirable? You know, I think in the beginning, that entrepreneurial spirit really got to them. They, they, they wanted to take a chance. They wanted to risk something to, to be their own boss. Um, to own their own company. And that's a very tangible feel to, to a business owner like this. And then, you know, it was exciting. They were young, it was kind of a new experience. And then as, as it really became more than just an idea it really became a company. And as year over year, they continued to, to grow or to maybe at least maintain the size that they were they realized the responsibility that that was on their shoulders. And so you see kind of in the later cycles of a business owner, you can kind of see the weight that's that they carry. It's not just a, a financial weight. It's, it's a it's kind of a people burden too. Uh, mm -hmm. most of the business owners that we know are, are that, that Hardeman type of business owner and company is usually the first or second question they ask us when we start a conversation is, well, what are you going to do with, with, with my employees? Mm -hmm. you know, Cause I think private equity has really gotten a bad name in kind of the slash and dash model. I'll buy this company I'll slash 50% of the assets, which typically are the people. And in a couple of years, I'll, I'll aggressively pay down debt and I'll sell it and make a killing. And um, you know, there's a lot of business owners that are really afraid of that. They, they don't want to see something that really is their identity, their reputation, just be dragged through the mud as, as kind of their last decision they ever make for the company. One thing we like to tell people is, hey, let, let's make your last decision be the best decision for your company. 
Sure. And some of that, a lot of that, well, it's all a great point, but some of it, you know, when you talk about the CEO of such and such large corporation, if they lose their job, they're probably going to get, or if they're not successful, they're going to get hired as a CEO or a consultant to another large corporation, a family business or a small business, not necessarily family business. If this, if the, if the leader of the business makes bad decisions or doesn't run the, the business right, a lot of people are impacted, right? And not, not just them. So that's, that's a great point. Yeah. And these small businesses, I mean, you're, you may have up to 30, maybe 50 employees at most. So it does become a family. I mean, you, <laughs> you're with you, you're with your employees eight hours a day, you know, six, seven days a week. Uh, for 10, 15, 20 years. So they really become a second family. I, I used to joke with my brothers that, um, you know, I'm one of three brothers and we always joked that my dad had, had a fourth child and it was, uh, it was the natural gas company TriStar mm -hmm. because he had to put so much sweat equity uh, into the business to be successful, to provide, you know, jobs, um, et cetera. And, and so that really is what these become to other small business owners. Sure. It's more than just a financial mechanism for their future wealth. Yeah. Well, good. So Hardeman has a, a nice portfolio of companies. As I mentioned earlier, some of your targets, according to your website and others, is service, manufacturing, um, other types of companies like that. So how do you decide your portfolio strategy? Are you looking for a specific mix of companies? Uh, you know, if you, if you buy one company, then do you focus on another sector? Looking for revenue targets? What are, what are some of the things you're looking at when you're acquiring companies or, or looking for companies? Yeah, you know, I think we're, we still have an opportunistic, or I guess an entrepreneurial bent. We, um, we're always curious. We're always willing to learn. And I think I've, I've told everybody on our team, the moment I'm, I'm not willing to learn anymore is the moment I, I, I probably need to retire. Um, we, we look for a specific type of, of person, I guess, specific, specific type of business owner, uh, more uh, as opposed to a specific type of business. Uh, some of the businesses that we have bought as we've really learned that industry and, and gotten excited about that industry, we may explore it further and get, take a deeper dive into that, into that industry. But for the most part, we, uh, we like meeting other business owners. Uh, we like talking to other, uh, other companies that are in different industries. I think that's the fun part about my job on a day-to-day -day is that I've met so many different people that run just so many diverse type of companies. Um, and it's, it's interesting to see their creativity. You know, some company that I never would have thought to have run or a business segment that I never would have considered, um, but they did. Right. And they had the creativity to to go after it. And so it's mm -hmm. fun to see that and to see to see that passion in their eyes. So we we, we truly invest in, in people and look for a specific type of person and business owner as opposed to a specific type of industry. Um, I'll say we're probably not your typical tech investors in the mm -hmm. sense that um, I just I, I don't understand technology as as well as the next guy. And so you can't really explain your business model or even your business to me in five or 10 minutes. I, I, I probably won't ever really understand it or at least try to understand a base knowledge of it. And, and that's, not, that's not a knock on any specific industry. That's more kind of knowing my limitations. I think Warren Buffett, uh, I read once said, don't ever invest in a company that you don't understand. Right. So it's that right. same concept here. If it's nothing, it's not a knock on those companies. There's a lot of great companies, but if you don't understand it, yeah. Why would you um, buy it? Why, why would anybody or invest in it or, or whatever the case may be? That's right. That's right. I had a, I had a friend. It wasn't a small business at the time, but a friend that was really telling me how awesome Tesla was. And, and it was really early on. And I, I just couldn't understand it and <laughs> shame on me, I guess, or the jokes on me, but um, maybe I should have spent more time learning about it. And, but yeah. Was, we probably all should have spent more time learning about Tesla. Maybe, yeah, maybe right. it's not too late. Um, <laughs> so you've looked at a lot of companies, you've acquired some of them. I'm sure you've passed on many of them. Uh, maybe some of them have passed on you, who knows, but, but whatever the case may be, what strategic advice would you give to a business owner 
in kind of in the business owners and the in the target that we're talking about, you know, small business, maybe small to mid-sized business run by family, been established for a while. What advice would you, what should they be thinking about um, to sell their company in 2021? What what should they be doing to prepare their company for acquisition if that's something they want to do? Yeah. So yeah, that's a that's a really great question. I kind of I compare it to selling your house, right? I mean, if you're going to sell your house, typically most people want to walk into the house, see the layout of the rooms, um, you know, just kind of get an idea of what what they're buying into, uh, not just for a full scale redo of the house, but just to to see the house. And so your house isn't in order, right? If it's not cleaned up, if things are rough shot everywhere, it's not going to be really um, attractive to a potential uh, future owner. Right. Uh, at least the one that wants to maintain the house and see it going on in the future as, as it originally stands. Um, so, you, you know, you maybe, you maybe put some putty on the walls. You may, you may clean up, uh, um, you know, the rooms, put the clothes away and such. And so similar with a business, um, you know, the, the, the privilege of owning your own business is you can almost treat it like a second uh, piggy bank. You can charge uh, a lot of expenditures, your own personal expenditures to the business. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> you can technically live through the business, all your cars, your, your meals, entertainment can all be expensed against the business. And that's not wrong. I'm, I'm not saying that's a bad thing, but when a new business owner comes in and they see all those costs, and, and you're trying to tell them, well, that's all personal expense that had no relation to the business necessarily. Well, how do you, how do you prove that up, right? Because um, then, then it's hard for another business owner or the future business owner to really see, okay, well, you know, all these added expenses, did they really help the business mm -hmm. or were you just living through and not necessarily paying out distributions for yourself? And, and then you, you're not you're not really preparing it for the future goal of a of a future owner and and then another thing that I really see really as a sticking point to businesses our business owners is the working capital piece um, in a very layman terms or at least how I understand it working capital is the cash needed to fund you know the 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 other assets of the business um, and I know that's a very kind of a very layman's term uh, definition but a lot of business owners see working capital as, as real cash that's theirs. And it's always been trapped into the business as an ongoing basis. And, sure. and that's true, but typically with businesses at this size, working capital is the key asset uh, of the business if you don't include the current owner president. So when you, you want a full valuation for your company, but you exclude the working capital of the business, you're already starting off on a um, on a disparate concept of evaluation of the business from a future business owner. Uh, a slash and dash guy may not care about the working capital. That's right. They can use a line of credit and it doesn't matter, but nor do they care about the preservation of the business uh, as a whole anyways, as an ongoing concern. So I think there's a lot of bad advice out there and, and, but if you want to see your business as an ongoing concern, as a continuation of your legacy, really, I really feel like you need to clean up, you need to just kind of clean up the business, clean up the difference between the business and you, mm -hmm. and consider that all assets of the business are, are critical to it, especially as you move away from the business. Sure. Yeah, that's good. That's great. Thanks. So speaking of acquiring companies, when you're um, looking at companies, when you're acquiring companies and, and by you are, I mean, Trent individually or Hardeman, obviously as the company, um, you're, you're competing, you're competing against many factors. Um, we're all competitors. So that probably gets us going in a lot of different ways, but some of the factors that I thought about were owner expectations, family member expectations. You might very well be competing against other purchasers, other acquirers, and many other factors that I don't even know about. So how do you balance seller expectations and other competing factors when you're in the, tr in the trenches of a potential acquisition? 
Yeah, and I think that's really usually first impressions go a long way, mm-hmm. and 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 owner expectations are key, right? And so if we we want a a business owner that's looking to sell their business, not just for a pure transaction, right? I mean, it's if that's all they're looking for, if they're looking for a payday, if they just want to know what the bottom line number is so they can take their money and they can they can leave, then that's that's probably not a business we're looking to acquire. We want somebody that really does care about their business legacy, about their reputation. And and usually we know in the first meeting if that's if the business owner we're talking to fits that mold, usually they all end up asking that question, what, what's going to happen to my employees? Are mm-hmm. you going to, who are you going to keep? How are you going to decide which ones to fire? And that's, that kind of fearful question is usually kind of the, the question we're looking for, knowing we're on the right page, we're in the right alignment with that, with the business owner who's, who's looking to sell. Um, because we care about those things too. It's not just a, a quantitative exercise for us. It's also a, a qualitative and that includes the people and the processes of the business sure all right well good so you and i have never discussed your competitive triathlete days and Mm -hmm. and you may not know this but i once was a great long distance runner myself i competed in the uh the white rock half marathon there you go. Sometime in the early 2000s. And, and for me, that was a big deal. I mean, for a lot of people, that's a big deal. It is a big deal. 13.1 miles is, is, is a big deal. The training, just going through it. I would probably still be running today, except for I hurt my Achilles back then. So I decided to, oh. I decided to retire. But uh, up, huh? what's that? Hang up the running shoes. <laughs> yeah, hung up the Hi. running shoes for that. So um, it was challenging and rewarding. But so just, you know, we, not to get into the, you know, all the days as a triathlete and all that, but what, what lessons did you learn when you're training for a triathlon and competing in a triathlon? What did some of that teach you that could be translated into business strategy? Um, I know that's a little bit vague and, and, but, but I'd love to hear, I mean, there's gotta be some practical things that you took from that or some business strategy um, uh, ideas that you took from that. Yeah, I call, um, so I, I had the opportunity to go train um, with a professional triathlon squad in Switzerland, and I really kind of consider that my MBA. The The coach was this this gruff former professional boxer from Australia and really imparted a lot of wisdom. And I, I felt that if I, 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 almost like everybody, right, like, there's this secret that the top 1% all have, whether it's in triathlon, whether it's in business, um, you know, anything. Uh, they, they have a secret. There's the secret, the secret sauce or secret type of training or some specialized form of what they're doing. And if I, if I could see it, if I could experience it, then it'd be as easy for me as it is for them. And so I jumped at the opportunity to go see and to go train with, with, know, future Hall of Famers and Ironman winners and Olympic gold medalists. And I noticed that there wasn't a training secret. I mean, every day, it's the same thing day in and day out. The biggest secret was their mind. They just loved doing it, right? They loved getting up and swimming for two or three hours. They loved uh, at 30 minutes from then going and running. They Mm -hmm. loved biking. And then they loved going to bed, getting up and doing it all over again. Wow. Um, and so they just day in, day out, consistent, hard work uh, that, that nobody ever saw. Everybody always saw the, the finished product of them winning races, um, winning awards and medals, but nobody else saw just the, the hard work they put on a day in and day out basis. And they loved that hard work. And I, I think that really... Um, that really meant a lot to me to see it, to realize that, Hey, it's just day in, day out, consistent work. It's not, it's not pretty, but it's like he told me once the man on top of the mountain didn't fall there. Mm -hmm. It took time to get there and you have to enjoy the journey just as much as the destination. If you, if you have a goal or if you see yourself, um, not the see to a believe, uh, to achieve type of motto, but if you, if you really 
want to to go after some goal, uh, go after it. Try as hard as you can to do it, and know that not every day is uh, is going to be the greatest day of your life. It may be a very mundane day of your life, but you put in one more day of work towards that goal. And and I think people forget about that in in this day and age of instant gratification. I remember one time I was complaining about a training session that I did really poorly, and he interrupted me and said, "Hey, I really don't." Care. did you do the training <laughs> and I said well yeah I did he said let me tell you something training these training sessions are like stones some days they're diamonds and some days they're just rocks but you're going to go pick up that stone and you're going to set it over here on this pile and you're going to do that for however long you want to keep doing this the rest of your life even and that eventual pile of rocks will become a mountain of work behind you that you get to carry wherever you go and you get to unleash it whenever the opportunity arises and and so i same with business i mean same with anything else just every day maybe some days you just have to really kick yourself to get out of bed and get going but do the work It, it may not make you the next warren buffett that specific day but the next day you may feel like you know warren buffett or jeff bezos and that consistency in that work will put together such an amazing amount of, of work behind you that your experience, your wisdom with all that will, will help you into the future, specifically in achieving whatever you're wanting to achieve. I, yeah, that's great. So your trainer sounds like maybe the Mr. Miyagi of triathlon training. I don't know. You know, I think so. He, he definitely had a, he had, he had a lot of good wisdom like that. He had a lot of really gruff wisdom. One of the one of the other best things he ever told me that I really enjoyed was um, he uh, I was I was swimming and he pulled me out of the pool and he said I don't know why you are trying to swim like Michael Phelps. You are very average, and you will only ever be average. So Michael Phelps is the freak of all of us, the one percent, right. like let him be Michael Phelps and let Michael Phelps swim like Michael Phelps. You swim like an average person, swim like that. And his point wasn't like, I'll never achieve, you know, excellence in swimming. And his point was, I'm never going to achieve, I'm never going to hit my highest potential in swimming if I try to swim like somebody who is incredibly gifted and unique. Sure. Um, Just naturally, if I can just, if I can swim to the best of my ability as just an average uh, you know, American man, then I can still uh, get to some pretty big heights. And, and I was able to do that. I mean, I, I still competed against some of the best in Europe, swimming like an average guy. An sure. average man. So, you know, some, some, some lessons are, are easy to swallow. But like my dad always said, good medicine is tough to swallow. And, and he was willing to, to give me some good medicine. Yeah, no, that's good. And, and, you know, along those points of just, you know, if you're average at something, that's okay. Um, although you're probably more of a little bit above average, like I might be average or somewhat, but anyway, that's a whole different story, but you know, and I, and I talk about this guy, Gary Vaynerchuk a lot on my podcast and, and really follow him. And he's got a lot of wisdom and a lot of great ideas. One of the things when I started listening to his podcast back, particularly once all the, the, um, the pandemic, everything kicked in. I remember listening to one of his podcasts and I think somebody had called in or was talking to him about wanting to be the number one and start their own company and all of that. And one of his points and one of his response was, you might not be a number one. You might be a number eight. Don't you think the number eight person at Facebook is okay? Or the number eight, you know, the number seven person. And it's kind of that same philosophy, you know, find your strength. It's okay to not be the number one person all the time at everything. It's okay to not be the CEO of McDonald's. What if you were the executive vice president of human resources? You're probably okay too, right? I mean, there's just- I think we get so lost in, in, in useless comparative analysis, right? I mean- who is, is Elon Musk or Jeff Bezos is now the richest man in the world. But I, I promise you this, somebody else will come along and will be richer than one of those sure. men. I mean, it, it, you know, LeBron James is an amazing, probably the, I guess you can, we can debate that, but, but probably the greatest basketball player, you know, of all time, maybe Kobe Bryant, Michael Jordan, but somebody will come along and be better. Mm-hmm. And, 
And if you get lost in comparing yourself to being the next Jeff Bezos, right, or the number one of anything, you, you lose focus on what's important. You have an amazing, we never, so I was, uh, I at least learned, especially in triathlon, we're not going to totally focus on our weaknesses. We're going to work on the weaknesses to make them okay, but we're going to maximize our strengths. And I think, uh, I think if you start comparing yourself to other people, you start trying to cover up or move into their strengths. And those may not necessarily be yours. All right. And, and if you're doing that, you're missing out on a lot of other opportunities that you could achieve. And so I may be a wildly successful businessman um, for myself. I may hit, you know, just like some of these small business owners are another great example of that. They hit a level of success that they found that's the level that they wanted to achieve. It's not wrong. They didn't fail. They, they may have owned a million dollar company. That's an incredible success story. Sure. Um, were they, you know, were they as wealthy as uh, Sam Walton? No, but, but you're not going to say that they didn't hit their highest potential. They didn't achieve the highest level of success that they could. They're a success story regardless of um, the heights that they, they didn't achieve to. So I think, I think so many people get lost in that and start comparing themselves to somebody that's already gone before them. And that's, that's meaningless. You can't, you can't be that person. You can only right. be who you are. And there's a certain level of success you can hit. I, I didn't become the world's greatest triathlete. I became the greatest triathlete I could ever come. And, and, sure. I, and I got to certain in, incredible heights in that. Um, not necessarily, I didn't achieve all my goals, but I wasn't a failure. I, I look at it as an, as an incredible success story for myself. Uh, um, nobody's going to write about it in a sports annual, you know, annals of uh, right. how awesome I was, but, th but that's okay. So, yeah, no, that's all great. Um, that, that's, that's really good. I, I, uh, you know, nobody's going to write about it, but at least we have the internet so I could find out the results. You know, I can always look them up, but just kind of to wrap things up here, who is your, this is a question I've been asking the last few, last few podcasts, but who's your favorite business leader and why? It doesn't have to be a well-known, it can be someone that's well-known. It just, who's your favorite business leader and why? Yeah, I, I like reading a lot of biographies, um, just just in general on on multiple topics and multiple people. But um, you know, when you really ask the why of why we started Hardeman, why we we moved from my dad's natural gas company to going and looking for other companies to own um, or to buy um, and run ourselves, so is all because of my dad and seeing my dad and, and the greatest business owner, the greatest businessman that I know is truly my dad. And, and I'll say this story because it's, it's specific to TriStar, but every small business has a similar story. And this is really why I love supporting this space is Enron was TriStar's largest customer at the time, mm -hmm. tune of $2 million, which wasn't really big to Enron, but it was huge to us and sure. our company. So when Enron failed, we never got to see any of that money. The debtors were all going to collect it before we ever saw a penny. My dad at the time was was stuck with a dilemma. You know, what do you do? Do you do we fire people? Do we cut salaries? Um, does he take a personal two million dollar loss to protect the business and the people? Uh, that are looking to him to, to make good decisions for the business. And my dad took a $2 million loss, a personal loss to, to not fire anybody, to not cut any salaries. Um, and that's right when, when my older brother was in college and I was about to go to college. So uh, a lot of bills were coming due for my dad on a personal level, but he put, he put his employees in the company first because it was the right thing to do. It wasn't their fault that, that a criminal company acted uh, irresponsibly. And so he wasn't about to punish them for that, for that action. Mm -hmm. and, and so that's really my why. I think when my dad 
told me back in 2016, hey, I'm ready to retire. And what does that look like? I could almost see that on his, on his face. Um, and, it, and it really struck me. And so I, I, wish I, could, I wish I could bottle it up and I wish I could show everybody. But I, I, when we're talking to these other business owners, I, I can see it in the other business owners' faces. I can, I can see that the hard work, the legacies, all that time and effort that I saw when I was at, when I was a little boy, you know, and my, my dad was, was not at all of my soccer games, right? He wasn't, sometimes he had to work the weekends and was doing everything he could to lift up this company. And then he said, what am I, you know, what do we do? What does this look like? We, we have people that have been working with us since 1992. And he said, what do we do with them? And, and, and it was such a, it was such an emotional question. Mm-hmm. And, and I just, I can, I can almost, I can almost feel it when another business owner asked me the same question, when I asked them, Hey, why are you thinking of selling the business? And then they respond back with similar answers or with other questions. And, and that's when you, you know, Hey, we're, we're tracking on the same level. We really right. both just love small business and we really care. Um, so that's, I think he taught me so much in that sense. And I really got to see it, not just from him teaching me, but from me watching him and just the, that, that had such a huge impact on me growing up and, and, and me as a business leader now that, that he probably is my, my favorite business businessman to really, really look to and study from. And, and sure. every once in a while, he'll come in here and impart, impart his wisdom to me as, as he deems fit. But um, yeah. Yeah, no, that's great. And I'm glad I, I, when I put this question together, I I was thinking, I wonder if he's going to say his dad, because I'd kind of heard some of that story. So I I think that's great. I think that's an awesome story. And I think it's great when children look to their parents as um, role models, for lack of a better word, but people that, that really impacted them. My father was the same for me. He wasn't uh, in business. He was a pastor. Um, and it's funny because he's written several books, but one of the books is called 17 roadblocks on the highway of life. Or I, I don't know the exact title, but I, I thought, man, I've got this great book. I've, I've read it a few times and I'm actually going to be producing some short content out of that. His was more from a spiritual nature, but taking those same concepts and moving them over to the business. But I guess the bigger point is the impact that our fathers can have on our lives personally and professionally, and not everybody gets to experience that. So I, I think that's, I think that's awesome. I think that's a great story. So if someone wants to get in touch with Trent Simmons, how do they do that? What's the best way for somebody to get in touch with you? Uh, LinkedIn is probably the best way to get in touch with me. I'm, I'm pretty active on LinkedIn, or at least, at least I, I look at it on a more consistent basis. Uh, my email address, I'm, I'm, Happy to, I'm happy to have uh, share my email address or call in if you want to share my email address and typically respond to most emails. Um, but those are the two best ways to, to get in touch with me. First. Sure. Okay. Well, good. Well, I, I want to thank you, Trent. Like I said, I, I've really uh, enjoyed getting to know you the last couple of years. I've enjoyed a, the, the few times that we've had coffee. One, one of the times we had coffee was like either the week of this pandemic outbreak or the week before. I don't remember. I think you were supposed to be going to Oklahoma with one of your children to see a baseball game or something. I don't, I don't know if you ever got to do that because everything, right. you know, all the wheels started coming off, but um you know, it's it's. Uh, I'm I'm glad to have this opportunity to talk to you about this stuff to for you to share this information with the listeners. And you know, quite frankly, it, it's it's great information. Um, it's always fun to talk. So, you know, thanks again for for being on the show. Thanks for for taking time out of your day uh, to do this. And and to all the listeners, thanks for listening. Thanks for watching. If you're on YouTube, like I said. Don't forget to like or subscribe. That's always helpful. Share the information with others and um, provide me feedback. I, I love hearing it. Um, uh, I've made the joke before that that when I first started the podcast, I sent it to some of my good friends to listen to and they provided me feedback and it was on a text chain. And, you know, that's when it starts out, you know, they trying to outdo each other on the feedback. That's not the kind of feedback I'm looking for. I'm looking for real feedback. But um, anyway, thanks a lot. And we'll talk to you soon. Thanks, Trent. Thanks so much. This is great. I really appreciate it. Thanks. Bye. Bye.